Five Fiddle. This is The Current, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Jennifer Palmieri, who is the best-selling author of Dear Madam President and the forthcoming author of She Proclaims, and of course is uh, very well known as the White House Communications Director during the Obama administration. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Clive. Happy to be with you. So uh, you have a new book, and we're going to talk about that first and foremost. Um, and it is, it's a feisty uh, declaration uh, for a world not governed by the rules set by men. Is that right. fair? Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to think about it. It's a, I wrote it as an actual declaration of independence from a man's world. And so it's timed with 4th of July. It's timed with the 100th anniversary of suffrage, uh, which is in August. And my sort of aha moment was that, you know, I thought I'd always been doing great in the world. and I didn't think of it as a man's world. I just thought of it as the world. And then I had this realization that I was not doing great. I was doing great making the man's world run well. I was like, I'm doing, I was like, oh, I am doing great perpetuating these systems that keep women, that keep people of color out of power. And I had always thought men were my allies and that would have been my experience. I don't think men are deliberately trying to keep women out, but it's just the game that we're playing is rigged against women. Um, and you just have to look at and accept that any system that consistently undervalues and underrepresents women in positions of power is not a world that we were meant to be in. So the book is to, to have women sort of acknowledge us, acknowledge how much work we have put into succeeding in a man's world, how hard it's been, appreciate those skills, value those skills, but change the things in your own mind that hold you back. And this 100th anniversary of suffrage was a good time to do it. And you, you say in the book that the, uh, the Women's March in 2017, in January of 2017, was, it was a sort of a huge moment for you, a demonstration that other women like you had really had enough they had said, this is not the world that I wanted to create. It's not the one I want to perpetuate. I'm going to get out on the streets. I'm going to show you that I care about this. I'm going to make a difference. And, and you drew inspiration from that moment, I think, for this book. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it, it, it was where I saw, oh, women have, something has flipped in women. And there's like a switch has flipped and we are never going back. I myself did not go to the Women's March. I was Hillary Clinton's communications director. I was obviously devastated by what happened. Normally, I get back up right away and start fighting again anytime I lose a presidential, any kind of political campaign. But this so knocked me down that I just, I thought, I'm going to pull back and wait and see what is America going to do in this moment. And then, I mean, when I saw that millions and millions of women were taken to a st the streets in a way they ha never have and had each other's back in a way they never have, I thought, okay. I just knew that moment, it's like, we are never going back. Um, and I knew that each of us, I felt an obligation, partly as a, you know, just as a woman, as somebody who worked um, on the Clinton campaign to try to make the first one president, I felt real obligations like, well, I got to pick up this ball and run with it too. I got to do whatever I can. Um, and um, if I had to say the book in one sentence, it's support other women. I think part of the way women are kept out of power is we buy into this notion that there's a limited amount of success to go around for women, right? <laughs> that it's a finite resource. No one thinks that there's that men's success is a finite resource because if they thought that the late night television show hosts would not look like what they did, right? There's plenty of room for them. Um, and if you buy into that, that you're in competition with another woman because only a few of you are allowed to succeed in the world, this is when you realize how messed up so, so much of what we've internalized is. We expect to do worse than men. We just expect that. We don't just accept it. We expect it. And that sense that that is that is nuts. After all women have done, after all men have done to help women get in a position to succeed, that is still my mind frame, right? So that's these are the kinds of things that we have to declare our independence from. You have to break from that belief and reorient your brain, control the things that are in your own control, and engage in the world differently. That's what those women in the march did. They had each other's so, backs, they didn't accept the status quo, and they engaged in the world they never did, and they understood the power of one woman to make a difference. Like, that's what I'm talking about. That is what the book is. 
So the, the, big, the big expression of politics in this country um, comes every four years. It's going to come four months after your book is published. And women are going to be given the choice of two 70-year-old white guys <laughs> um, plus, plus a ticket. So what are yeah. they to do? How are they to navigate this moment? How, how, do they, how do they vote and feel good about it? How do women do it? Well, yeah. I've, I, as you might imagine, Clive, I have thought very hard about how it is we ended up with two 70-plus-year-old white guys. Um, and at the end of the Democratic primary, we had two 70-year-old white plus white guys in the form of Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. And then we have Biden and Trump at the end. And I believe it is because, I mean, Joe Biden truly was the most experienced person in the Democratic primary. And I think that that mattered a lot for voters. But this is the last time that is going to happen because you needed to be Joe Biden, who was elected at age 29. You needed to be him and have that have 50 years of experience in public life to beat Elizabeth Warren, to beat Amy Klobuchar, to beat Kamala Harris, right? You know, when when Elizabeth Warren was was Joe Biden's was was 29, being elected a senator was not a thing for women, right? So it is, I think, I think that is what accounts for the fact that we ended up with such old older men um, as leaders. And, you know, not that it's a war, but I think it's sort of the battle of the bulge, right? Like this is the, I think this is the end for that generation. And the next time women aren't going to be handicapped because decades ago they didn't have the opportunity that men have, right? They have, we sort of have in politics the same opportunity now, the women always have it much harder and much harder, but we're still living the effects of the decades and decades of, um, of sexism, gender bias that kept women out of positions of power long ago. Because we know at our core that we think women should do well and women should succeed there as, there as you know, then uh, I think that we can fall more into the trap of, well, you know, so-and-so is just a better fit for that job. You know, sure, um, uh, you know, men and women, you know, and I have, I have a chapter in the book that's advice for men. And because um, I say, if you interview men and women both and you consistently find that you're just having to default to the man as the better fit, you need to look more closely at what's going on in your brain. Um, you don't have to be sexist for gender bias to be um, uh, at play. It, there's a lot of research that shows we judge men on their potential and we judge women on their record of achievement. And so that automatically puts women at a disadvantage to men, particularly younger women. Um, and we judge men on their potential and think about it, it makes sense because we've seen their story play out for hundreds of years. <laughs> we recognize him right away. Right? Mm -hmm. Pete Buddha Judge, Beto O'Rourke. We recognize those guys right away. We're like, we're like, oh, it's like Jimmy Smith and Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know. Oh, it's like Atticus Finch defending the defenseless. Uh, we have all these models in our mind and we don't have that for women. And so I think that that's what I'm pushing everybody to do. And some, you know, some of the biggest offenders of gender bias are people on the left because they're so certain that they, that couldn't possibly be in their brain. And because because it, individually they've accomplished a huge amount and they are very confident, but you're talking about the system. You're talking about, you're talking about something larger than the individual. You're talking about the archetypes and the, and the big structures. Yeah. Which are making it much harder for women than for men. And I just did not appreciate, you know, when I went to work for Hillary Clinton, um, I did not think it was that big of a deal or that hard to elect the first woman president. I just thought Hillary was the best person for the job. Um, and so, and then I like walked into this buzzsaw <laughs> of, you know, all of this crazy gender bias that revealed itself in, in the press coverage and the way Trump reacted to her and, um, how there's just something about her I don't like all of these intangibles that you realize something much more powerful and even primal is going on under the surface here. And I, just didn't appreciate how important, I'm stupid to say now, how important role models are to know what a president looks like, what a president sounds like, to see a woman in that role. I wanted to ask you one more thing, really, which is uh, a lot of people who are in politics now, um, a author we published, Janet Napolitano, was completely uh, mm -hmm. uh, straightforward about this, got into politics because they, they love the West Wing. 
Um, they watch the West Wing and they love the West Wing. Now, you, of course, uh, you're, you're kind of C.J. Craig um, in, in your time. Uh, you were the press uh, communications director. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever watch the show? So I did. Um, it started while I was in the Clinton White House. So they so came, yeah. So they came to meet with us while they were making it. So we met with them in real time before we even saw it. And I thought they did a remarkably good job, particularly at that time period, capturing what it was like for the staff. Um, I will tell you this though. Uh, later came Veep, right? Yeah. Veep is slightly closer to real life than yeah. the West Wing. <laughs> It's a little filthier too, I think. <laughs> yeah, Veep, that's the one thing. Veep is definitely, that's your people, Clive. That was the that was the, the British writers Mr. brought that. Mr. Yanucci had something to do with that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, um, but it was, uh, it's not as racy or as mean as Veep is. Um, but wow, I mean, some of those situations are very i could were very relatable there was one scene in the where amy who was the campaign manager is sitting at a bar with one of her colleagues and she said describing her experience this is she said this is like this is this was like what it felt like to be on the clinton campaign she said i feel like i'm on life support and people keep pulling the plug to charge their phones <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who doesn't even work in politics capture in one sentence my entire experience on this campaign because, like, that is what it was like. Yeah, uh, charge their phones. Well, you know, of course, in, and famously in Veep, she she does make it just barely. Yeah. <laughs> she does get all the way. So yeah. we salute we salute uh, Selena Mayer um, <laughs> for breaking that glass ceiling. We hope that that she will inspire a real life example. And in the interim, we do thank Jennifer Palmieri and her forthcoming book, She Proclaimed, and for joining us today. It's been a delight. Thank you so much. Oh, it's so fun, Clive. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Pleasure. Hachette.